Republicans have a choice. They can either stop serving as the fossil fuel industry's bought and paid for lackeys, or they can go down in history as the handmaidens of the apocalypse. For more on that, let's turn things over to tonight's Big Picture panel. With me for tonight's Big Picture panel are Richard Holt, member of Project 21, a political consultant with serious campaigns, and Valerie Irvin, senior advisor to the Working Families Party. And thank you both for being here with Thanks us tonight. Great, it's great to have you here. Hurricane Irma, which has now been downgraded to a tropical storm, was one of the most destructive storms in American history. Major cities like Jacksonville are still underwater, while six million people remain without power across Florida. Countless homes, businesses, and public buildings have also been destroyed. Expect damage estimates, uh, expected damage estimates are as high as $172 billion. This is what climate change looks like, and it's only going to get worse. So when are Republicans going to stop taking money from the fossil fuel industry so that we can have a serious national discussion about this issue? Richard so and Valerie? Is this the fault of Republicans who don't agree with the liberal position on climate change. It's not the liberal position, it's the scientific position. What is it the scientific position on climate change? In 2000, change? Mike Pence wrote an article for mm -hmm. national publication about how tobacco doesn't cause cancer. He did that because he was getting money from the tobacco industry. Right. The reason why these people are denying what 100% of climate scientists who don't work for oil companies or fossil fuel companies, 100%, why they're denying what these people are saying is because they're taking money from the fossil fuel industry. What are the possible answers there? I don't think that there's one single answer for why the climate is changing. And I don't think Republicans are necessarily wrong. But you're not a climate scientist. You're wrong. You're right. I'm not a climate <laughs> scientist. And you know what? Neither is the mayor of Miami who made these charged comments while people are scared, while they're running away from a hurricane, trying to blame it's the best conservatives. Time to figure out what the hell is going on. <laughs> right, why did this happen? No... It happened because of conservatives. But see here, <laughs> that, that's, that's funny. But well, it's not realistic. It didn't happen because of conservatives. No, of a, a genuine not. good conservative would say, if the science is there, just like a genuine good conservative would say, you know, I've got an infection, I should take an antibiotic. They'd say, you know, if the science says that we need to decarbonize the atmosphere, we need to decarbonize But the, the science atmosphere. doesn't say that it hurricanes actually does say are that. worse as a result of any yes, it climate change. Yes, it does. The, the ocean was seven degrees warmer than it should have been, 70 to seven degrees warmer than the, than the average the over the last But the temperature hasn't changed years. in 26 years. And, no, not true. With and all and the atmosphere industry. is a full degree warmer right now than it was in 1980 when Reagan came into power. And yes, the, you know, the last, the, uh, out of the last 15 years, we've had 12 of the, the, the hottest years in the history of uh, human, humans on mm -hmm. Earth. I mean, and, and, and the, the atmosphere can hold 7%, 6% more moisture, which means that the storms are that much more intense, that much more rain. And the, and the fuel for hurricanes is the temperature of the water, and the water is seven degrees warmer than it should be. So, I mean, this is a problem. Well, Albert. I'm going to disagree with my friend because I think that the, that the science around global warming is very clear and has been very concise about why we're having these massive storms. So we, so we finished up Harvey. We saw what it wreaked on Houston and, and, and Louisiana. And so now we're in Irma, and we have Jose on the, on, in the in the Atlantic churning. They're, they can't even really tell which direction he's going. But when the water is 89 degrees, like it's been over the last several days while this hurricane has gained strength, a couple of things come to my mind. One is, where are the Republicans on climate change? And two, it's that in Houston and in Florida, what we're seeing is uh, money taking uh, a front seat uh, in the overdevelopment of of much of the country. And mm -hmm. so when you, when you live in Florida, a peninsula that was once a swamp, and then it's engineered for people to live on sand that, come, that they have to dredge up from the bottom of the ocean, it's a recipe for disaster. So you have rising waters in Florida, and you have impervious surface for miles and miles and miles around Houston, and global warming on top of that, you have disasters in many major U.S. cities. Yeah, yeah. It's, unless you wanted to add something else. Well, I think client, um, climate scientists have a vested interest in continuing to do research on this issue. If you wanted to do research on a chipmunk, for example, and its eating habits, you're going to get denied funding a lot of the times, right? But if you say you want to, you want to uh, investigate the effect that 
climate change has on how chipmunks eat, suddenly the doors are going to open up, money is going to flood in. So there has been a preponderance of oh, what's your money point? going. Okay. What's your okay. point? I see you, and I see you, and I raise you. Okay. Um, the 22 Republican senators who sent a letter to Donald Trump just before he pulled out of the Paris Accord, when he was waffling and his, you know, he had met with Al Gore and Leo DiCaprio and his daughter, and he was saying, "Well, I don't know." Those 22 Republican senators in the last three years took over 10. Point three million dollars just from fossil fuel interests and those same fossil fuel interests invested over 90 million dollars during that period of time in Republicans we don't know who because it was all dark money so it may well have been those same 22 people but 10 million dollars that's a hell of a lot more than any scientist is making studying chipmunks or climate change or anything else so I mean, maybe it's just dueling money, okay? <laughs> we'll see. Okay, Oregon's Jeff Merkley, New Jersey's Cory Booker, New York's Kirsten Gillibrand. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, wrong story. Today is the 16th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Donald Trump commemorated the occasion by attending a memorial at the Pentagon where he issued this warning to future terrorists. But America cannot be intimidated, and those who try will soon join the long list of vanquished enemies who dared to test our metal? That kind of bombastic talk is exactly the sort of thing that got us into two disastrous wars, and it speaks to something I want to talk about. Every now and then, excuse me, every 9-11, we say we'll never forget what happened that day. But isn't it actually more important that we never forget what happened after 9-11? That is to say, the Bush administration's response. We had the entire world with us right after 9-11. In downtown Tehran, Iran, they had candlelight vigils for us all over the planet. People were saying, like we did, you know, after after uh, Charlie Hebdo, you know, Jesuit, Charlie, you know, I am Charlie. In France, the headline was, "We are all Americans." Everybody all around the world. And then Trump, uh, excuse me, then Bush turns this thing into a "They're terrible, and we're going to go have a war." After Afghanistan uh, offers. Mullah Omar offered to arrest bin Laden and hand him over to a third country for prosecution. Instead, Trump said, I, you know, I want to spend a trillion dollars and have a war. I, this is like the craziest thing. And then, and then he lies us into a war in Iraq, too. I mean, shouldn't we be, shouldn't this be part of the 9-11 memorial? Valerie? Absolutely. I, I think that something you said earlier about, uh, that was on the clip about the imperialist sort of like mindset of Americans, it's really like disturbing, especially in the times we're living in right now. So we have a president who is just like fast and loose with wanting to just like go after, you know, uh, Korea and others uh, in the world. And, and I think as someone who doesn't believe in war for the sake of war, I wonder what's really behind all of it. And it all comes back down to money. Uh, in Iraq, it was oil. Uh, and so we just need to sort of really understand what it is we're after, that we have to kill hundreds of thousands of people to get at it. Yeah, in, in, in Afghanistan, it's a trillion dollars worth of rare earth minerals. minerals. Yeah. The Soviets tried to get it. We're trying to get it. Um, but bin Laden, this is what bin Laden had to say, Richard. This was in 2004. He said, all we have to do is send two Mujahideen to the furthest point east to raise a piece of cloth on which is written Al-Qaeda in order to make generals race there to cause Americans to suffer harm, economic and political losses, without their achieving anything of note other than some benefits for their private corporations. Well, that's exactly the kind of hostile language that sees America as an empire who has no heart. How many more people would have died in the Middle East if we had not intervened? Now, I'm not going to defend going after a country that did not attack us like Iraq, but America has largely held the torch for shaping a global order for democracy, and sometimes that gets ugly. And it's unfortunate that it's happened the way that it has, but we've got terrorists right now causing a muck. We've got ISIS, largely caused by pullouts of Iraq. We, we've got to be on the march. The ISIS. American Revolution ISIS is not ISIS was yet. caused by Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was, 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 you know, uh, Osama bin Laden was, was funded and trained by the U.S. CIA. I mean, this, you know, he was our guy, the Mujahideen, fighting the Soviets. Um, I don't see how you can blame this on Obama. <laughs> well, this isn't, I think our foreign policy has been going, when you take the Mujahideen, uh, people who had been our allies, people who we had trained and helped and assisted. Right. Bin and Laden. Yeah, Bin Laden. And we have a habit of just playing switch over in the Middle East. Yeah. And oh, so you're I making think, the Charlie Wilson's war argument. I, I suppose that the problem that I've really got with our foreign policy and 
the reason it's been perhaps so disastrous is because we haven't had a stable hand, a stable agenda. It feels like it, it continues to change. You know, Reagan gave us a stable hand through the Cold War, and I don't think we've had that stability since then. So we're, we're constantly changing. You know, we're going after this country, we're bombing that country, we're invading this country. At what point in time are we going to have a single cohesive goal for how we want the world to look? I and agree. I think the lack of that is why I, we have so I, many I agree. problems. We need, we need such a thing. Okay, to our third topic. Oregon's Jeff Merkley, New Jersey's Cory Booker, New York's Kristen Gillibrand, and Rhode Island's Sheldon Whitehouse, all four of them today are officially on board the single-payer train. The four senators revealed that they are co-sponsoring Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill, which is set to be introduced later this week, probably Wednesday. Booker revealed his decision during an interview with New Jersey Public Television. I'm signing on to Medicare for All, which is, I'm, I'm excited to do this week. Senator Sanders and myself and others are going to be announcing some legislation. I'm signing on to some other of my colleagues, all of us working towards this understanding that if you look at American history, it has always been advancements towards greater equality, greater access, greater opportunity. And uh, in my opinion, Bernie could have won the presidential election, and now it appears as though his policies are winning over the Democratic Party. Is single payer now pretty much inevitable as the Democratic mainstream Democratic Party position? I, I should note, we've got, I think, nine or ten Democratic senators who are saying yes. That means there's 30-some-odd who are saying no. So, Valerie, you're nodding your head. I, are just you just really an thrilled. optimist? Or? Yeah, no, I'm just really <laughs> thrilled because I've been on the show with you before where this has been a topic. And I think that the American public has pushed the issue so far that our elected leaders in Congress have no other option but at least to listen to it. I think Cory Booker, you know, he's, he's piling on. Maybe he's going to run for a bigger office. Who knows? Oh, but it's not. It's anybody not. who thinks that all si all of these guys are not yeah. running for president. Right. I didn't want to say that, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, but it, it's a message. It's messaging to the American public that we hear you, mm -hmm. and we've been through eight months of a Trump presidency that really put him and Republicans and Democrats on notice. Richard, we have 30 seconds. Yeah, I think the Democrats really screwed the pooch when they sent Hillary out of the country in 08. Um, when they made her Secretary of State, she was the champion for health care, and they really they dropped the ball on creating universal care. I think they're going to drop it again this time. We've got a Republican Senate. We've got so you think 30 the Democrats senators. dropped the ball. I think the Democrats did drop the ball when, Ob when they had Obama in the White House. They sent their health care advocate, Hillary Clinton, made her Secretary of State, sent her out of the country. They could have. They yeah, could have. She worked made, pretty hard on it back yeah, in Yeah, she did. Three, she did, and they, six, whatever that the was their goal and moment, and I think they blew yeah. it. Yeah, remarkable. Remarkable. Richard Holt, Valerie Irvin, thank you both very much for being with us. And that's